Again, good morning, everyone. Let me welcome you uh, to the Human Cell Atlas Asia 2023 meeting. Uh, my name is Partha Majumdar. I've been assisted by a group of people internationally to organize this meeting, and it's my privilege uh, to um, be here, to be standing in front of you and uh, telling you a few things about the Human Cell Atlas. Uh, many of you are actually members of the Human Cell Atlas, but many of you are not. So the Human Cell Atlas's mission is to create a comprehensive reference maps of all the cells in the human body as a basis for both understanding uh, human health and diagnosing, monitoring, and treating disease. That's really the mission of uh, the Human Cell Atlas. Um, essentially, what we are trying to do is to uh, elucidate or create an atlas of the cellular composition of different tissues of the body uh, that comprises different organs. Um, the Human Cell Atlas was uh, founded in 2016 by uh, Dr. Aviv Regev, who is right now in Genentech, and uh, Dr. Sarah Teichman, who is uh, in the Welcome Sanger Institute in the UK. Um, Dr. Regev will give the first keynote address. She's already uh, present uh, uh, in, in the middle of us, uh, or amidst, amidst us. She is giving a virtual talk. She wasn't able to be here, but we are eagerly looking forward to hearing from her. Um, the Human Cell Atlas is an open consortium. It's a global consortium. It's an open consortium. Anybody can, anybody interested in the uh, mission of uh, Human Cell Atlas can become a member of the Human Cell Atlas. Currently, there are 3,163 members from 97 countries, including 91 from India. Um, it is a collaborative enterprise, primarily because different domains of science, expertise on uh, different domains of science are necessary to create this human cell atlas, uh, including computation, wet lab, uh, annotation, and all of this. So um, it is really a, a, an enterprise that comprises multiple science domains, and therefore it's uh, highly collaborative in nature. The data that's being generated by the Human Cell Atlas uh, it's, is essentially open access, except for certain parts of it which are sensitive, uh, but, uh, and that's meant to protect individuals, uh, privacy of individuals who have uh, contributed to the data generation in the Human Cell Atlas. Um, we, uh, the, the, there are multiple biological networks as we are, uh, you know, as we have organized the Human Cell Atlas, Obviously, the human body has multiple biological networks and different um, subsets of people or different sets of people are actually trying to build uh, the um, atlas of d different biological networks. So one can become a member of a specific biological network, and I'll uh, say a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. Um, the um, uh, two of the atlases, uh, organ atlases, have been released this year. The lung and the brain atlases have been released this year and they're all open. You can uh, look at it using the internet, and uh, the Human Cell Atlas website describes uh, all of that. Um, the uh, other is that, uh, you know, the Human Cell Atlas uh, focuses on capturing human diversity, which Human Cell Atlas thinks is very critical. So um, right in the beginning of the formation, towards the beginning of the uh, Human Cell Atlas, uh, the equity working group was formed, and the equity working group essentially uh, promotes uh, you know, involvement of communities, involvement of multiple um, groups from multiple scientific groups from all parts of the world, and so on. So uh, equity is uh, in the frontier of uh, the Human Cell Atlas. The Human Cell, we are meeting for the Human Cell Atlas um, Asia 2023 meeting. So there are some net regional networks that have formed uh, primarily to promote um, access and uh, uh, contribution to the data that are being generated by uh, the Human Cell Atlas. The Human Cell Atlas HCA Asia was the first regional network that was formed, and uh, we are having the annual meeting of the Human Cell Atlas Asia regional meeting today. Uh, the Human Cell Atlas Asia is uh, primarily involved in uh, development of the Asian Immune Diversity Atlas, um, and, and uh, it's also, uh, you know, expanding to other, other kinds of projects. Um, we do have a very strong interest in outreach, uh, education, and involvement of local communities, as I've said. Uh, we in India, those of us who are working uh, under the umbrella of the Human Cell Atlas, are actually 
working with local communities, we reach out to local communities, explain what this is all about, not just as a part of collection of samples, but more generally uh, to provide to the general community the ethos of uh, the Human Cell Atlas. Um, so this is, this is what I'll say as a matter of introduction. I have uh, some, uh, you know, nitty gritties to provide to you and I'll use slides for that. Um, the first thing that I will uh, mention is that, uh, you know, this, this, this entire meeting is going to be photographed both still and video. And we seek your uh, permission to, uh, you know, um, do the photography. Uh, capture all of the uh, proceedings of this meeting using, uh, you know, both still and video photography. I hope that I have your uh, in approval, not just during the meeting, but also uh, in future times, because we use these for uh, other kinds of um, uh, pr both promotion and education. Um, if you have any problem, then uh, please raise your hand. Uh, and we may actually ask you to uh, use, uh, you know, to sit elsewhere and use the online uh, mode of uh, participating in this. Uh, so your presence in this hall means that we have your uh, approval to, um, you know, photograph and both video and, and capture images essentially. Um, the details are written on this slide which you may have read. There are certain codes of conduct that we follow. One is in terms of inclusivity. Uh, we actually uh, try and be, uh, embrace uh, people of all shades, all uh, creed, color, uh, whatever, physical challenges, doesn't really matter, but we are completely inclusive and uh, therefore we must honor the inclusivity. The other is accessibility, so if you have any special needs for accommodations, etc., we make sure that you, are, uh, you do not face any problems and uh, the hall, the rooms, etc., can be accessed by everyone. Um, the third is that we, we have to have mutual respect to other people, we shouldn't look down and that's something that uh, HCA promotes and, uh, you know, respect is some, something that HCA promotes and uh, strictly adheres to. Harassment is something that's absolutely a no-no um, under the banner of the HCA. Harassment of any kind, not just sexual harassment, but verbal harassment, whatever, no form of har harassment is uh, tolerated at all uh, in the um, Human Cell Atlas. So if, uh, if anybody is caught harassing others or anybody complains of harassment, you will be uh, absolutely tossed out of this meeting. Um, so these are these are essentially the uh, you know the codes of conduct that's followed in, in the Human Cell Atlas, and please please adhere to these uh, codes of conduct. The meeting could not have been held without generous support from uh, various organizations, both in terms of logistical support as also in terms of financial support. The uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, the Clarman Family Foundation. And the Welcome Trust General Operation, Welcome Trust um, have provided support uh, for the general op uh, operations of the Human Cell Atlas uh, Asia 2023. Uh, we are also very thankful to the Liver Foundation, West Bengal. Uh, West Bengal is the name of the state where we are in, in right now, West Bengal, um, uh, for hosting this meeting. And we are very, very grateful uh, to the people of, uh, to the to the workers of um, Liver Foundation who have stayed up all night to make this happen, essentially. Um, make the, you know, the, the set up the entire podium and, and the hall. Um, uh, health and safety is important uh, to all of us and there are safety officers in the hotel. Um, so if you have any problems, just let us know. There are health and safety officers, so we'll take care of that. Uh, they're just a call away. Um, there also, we follow, uh, you know, color codes. Uh, many of you may actually not want to be, uh, you know, handshaken or whatever. So there are three different codes that we are using, and uh, I'm sure that you have been explained at the registration desk uh, what these color codes mean. Um, and if you if you have respiratory symptoms, uh, please do let us know. And uh, especially if you have both respiratory symptoms and uh, fever, then please do let us know. Um, and uh, then we'll make special arrangements for you. Uh, as you may have realized, most of the activities of this meeting will be held on this floor. Uh, most academic sessions will be held in this particular hall. 
there are concurrent breakout sessions which are going to be held in the two adjacent halls. The poster session is going to be held in the room called Sapphire, uh, which also will house one of the, um, will ho in which we'll also hold one of the uh, breakout sessions. Uh, coffee and tea will be continuously available uh, on the, in the hallway. You are welcome to bring in coffee, food, whatever, but just be, be a little careful. Don't leave your cups, take your cup back to the hallway and leave it in the hallway. Uh, also, if you, if you spill, avoid spilling, and if you do spill, kindly clean up. There are uh, counters, separate counters for non-vegetarian, vegetarian, and for vegan. Uh, the uh, hotel has made a arra special arrangement for a separate table. That's what I've been told. Those of you um, who have dietary restrictions, uh, you've already let us know, but please identify yourself so that we can take you to the proper counter. And especially if you're vegan, we can take you to the uh, right table. Uh, restrooms are around the corner on this floor. Uh, like I said, food and beverage policy is that you can bring in, but again, um, clean up if you uh, spill. Uh, personal belongings, you have to take care of your own personal belongings. Um, like I said, the uh, HCA Asia meeting has been, uh, the program committee, <coughs> the program of this meeting has been set by a group of international researchers who are all members of the um, HCA, and that's a list of people who, who uh, have actually worked very hard um, to you know, put up this, um, the, the program of this meeting. Um, so, like I said, that there are multiple biological networks and anyone can contribute to the Human Cell Atlas. We welcome you to join um, one or more of the biological networks. Being a member of, the, of a biological network, you can help select data sets that uh, need to be integrated for drawing abs uh, proper inferences. You can help implement the HCA network, uh, bio network roadmap for your organ or tissue of interest, and you can do several other things and uh, become a member of a network and you'll get to know what you can, how you can contribute and what you can do to help uh, uh, you know, promote the cause of HCA. Um, I don't know why it's going back. Uh, um, there are 18 biological networks right now, and you can join any one of the uh, biological networks. There's also a poster outside, so and and, and the QR code, so you can um, you know help yourself and uh, to join one of the biological networks, one or more of the biological networks. Um, so that's what I said, to, be, uh, to find out more about the biological networks, there are posters outside, you can um, you know, go to the appropriate website. We are building the Atlas together. Overall meeting goals are to facilitate trans uh, transnational collaborations in the Asia-Pacific region. That's the goal of um, the HCA Asia, this year's meeting, 2023. Um, enhance the capabilities of data generation and analysis uptake of technologies in the HCA, in the Asia Pacific region. We of course welcome new members. Uh, the badges indicate their names. Um, virtual attendees must uh, communicate proactively using chat or what, however. Uh, there are some virtual attendees who are actually attending um, and, and we'll hear um, Dr. Aviv Regev uh, give the first keynote address. She's uh, presenting virtually. Um, you can also contribute. If you have any suggestions, let us know how we can improve ourselves, how we can expand ourselves. Finally, one of the co-founders of, uh, of Human Cell Atlas is this. Our goal is to create a representative atlas that will benefit humanity. So that's eventually the goal of the Human Cell Atlas is to benefit humanity. Thank you very much. Um, we will have the first uh, keynote address, uh, which will be by Aviv Regev. Um, I will uh, introduce Aviv, uh, whom I have known for many years, who has been very helpful to us uh, to get started. Uh, so she is uh, the Executive Vice President and Head of Research and Early Development at Genentech. Formerly, she was uh, with the Broad Institute and the MIT. She's on leave uh, from those institutions. Uh, we are not going to, uh, you know, describe uh, their contributions to science elaborately, uh, but essentially we'll keep that short so that we don't uh, cut into her time, her speaking time. She's a member of the Howard Hughes um, Medical Institute. Uh, 
uh, and a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. So you can always you can imagine that she's made stellar contributions to science. Uh, particularly in computational biology uh, and promoting the human cell atlas and contributing to the human cell atlas. Uh, Aviv is uh, standing by, so I will move out and Aviv will <clears throat> come and give the first keynote address, which is on state of the HCA. Thank you very much for your attention. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Human Cell Atlas meeting. I wish I could be there, but between uh, family obligations and work that I have to do next week uh, in New York City, it was impossible to also make it uh, to the meeting itself, and I'm very grateful to the opportunity to open the, to provide the opening talk and really give you a little bit of an update of what Human Cell Atlas is about for those who are new to this consortium and area. Um, and where we are headed, both to new ones and to um, our more established members. So as we all know, the basic unit of life is the cell. Each of us is made of about 37 trillion cells, and they come in many different types, like our neurons, our immune cells, our muscle cells, and our fat cells. Knowing those cells is very important because it's essential to our understanding and to our ability to act on the genetic causes of diseases. So if there's a genetic variant that confers risk for disease, all the cells in the body carry the same variant, but the disease is only going to manifest in those cells um, of the different types and states that actually use or express this gene. And so knowing our cells is essential for understanding the genes that cause disease, where they act, and how to uh, tackle them. But the only problem is that even now, we don't really know how many different cells there are and who they are and what are their characteristics. If you'll open something like Wikipedia, it would tell you that there are maybe 300 major cell types, but if you ask a neuroscientist, they will tell you, of course, that just in your retina, there are more than 100 subtypes, um, well more than 100 subtypes of neuron, and each type is doing something quite different. And so what we need is a map or an atlas in our parallels uh, with the clear coordinates that would let us know all of our cells, uh, what their molecular characteristics are, and ideally what their functions are. And as a first approximation, um, one way in which to characterize cell is by the genes that they express. And of course, this is all wonderful, but we would need information in order to generate a map or an atlas like that. And for a long time, that was actually rather challenging because of experimental limitations. But the lab methods that really came together in the last decade or so, first in single cell genomics, where we can measure um, genes in each cell individually, and more recently with spatial genomics, where we can perform these measurements where the cells are all organized together in the tissue, really opened the way for us to go after this problem in a systematic um, and coordinated way. And that became the mission of the um, Human Cell Atlas. And about seven years ago, in October 2016, a group of us came together to set this new mission to create um, a comprehensive reference map of the types and properties of all human cells as a basis for understanding, diagnosing, monitoring, and treating in health and disease. And, you know, over that uh, period of time, the first meeting, there were um, 93 scientists, and the HCA community has grown in the last several years dramatically. And we're especially proud of our truly global footprint, including in the global south. So we now have leadership um, in a vibrant and growing membership across the globe, including in South America, Africa, and the Middle East, which together with the long-standing and, and, and still increasing membership in North America, Europe, Australia, and of course Asia, this means that we can really build a diverse atlas by scientists in communities across the world. Um, overall, to date, we have passed uh, the 3,000 member mark from 97 countries and 1,600 institutions. And you know, um, when we last time I showed this slide was actually in the summer in Toronto, it was 95 countries, and it was only about 1,500 institutions. So things are still growing quite um, rapidly. Um, now, when we set HCA, one of our premises, as stated in our mission statement, was that we expected to learn many insights into disease. So I wanted to share a few very brief examples as to what are the things that we have learned from it over the years. And this has spanned all different kinds of diseases, rare diseases like cystic fibrosis, cancers like melanoma, common diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, and infectious diseases like COVID. So for example, in the lung cell atlas, 
uh, we discovered a new cell type called now the ionocyte, which turns out to be a cell type that expresses and, is, and requires the gene that causes cystic fibrosis, CFTR. For the previous 30 years, scientists thought by mistake that another cell type expressed CFTR. And discovering a cell like this would be essential for some therapeutic efforts, especially in gene and cell therapy for CF. Or if you look at a cancer cell atlas of a disease like melanoma, it helps us uncover a particular kind of cancer cell which activates a gene program that um, contributes to the resistance to immunotherapy. So even though some patients that were not, even though some patients were not yet uh, treated, they already had these resistant cells or cells in this resistant state up front, which would explain intrinsic resistance. And this then helps scientists predict which patients might respond to therapy or not, but also to um, envision the development of new um, new treatments that could tackle the cell state and uh, render um, tumors more sensitive to immunotherapy. Or if you look at something like the gut cell atlas in inflammatory bowel disease, by comparing a, a disease atlas of, of IBD to a healthy gut atlas, we're able to discover new cell types that are unique in the disease tissue and that express risk genes that are associated from genome-wide association studies of IBD. And this provides, again, new targets that we can tackle in patients, especially those that do not benefit from current therapies. And then using the entire atlas, the human cell atlas community helped decipher the cells that are infected by SARS-CoV-2 in COVID-19. And so very early uh, queries of the atlas showed that the virus likely infects 82 cells in the lung. This was actually in the very early part of 2020. And in the following few months in 2020, the HCA community really banded together to query its own growing atlas and discovered cells all over the body, the nose, the intestines, the olfactory epithelium, the liver, the heart, the kidney, the brain, the vasculature, and more that might help explain the very complex and diverse pathology of COVID-19. Um, HCA labs also profiled cells from organs from autopsies of patients who succumbed to COVID-19, and that helped understand how the virus causes severe disease that can end up in death. And of course, all of these data and more come from those 18 biological networks that Partha, um, that Partha highlighted, each of them focused on a different organ or system as well as networks that are devoted to overarching goals, like creating a genetically diverse atlas or tackling human development. So the number of individual cells and samples continues to grow. And let me just pick on a few highlights from the networks. So first, progress around the nervous system and the brain has been really substantial this year, especially thanks to the Brain Initiative. They just actually released a draft brain atlas um, this came out very recently in a series of papers. Um, and they're now picking up further speed as part of a sub-initiative called BICAN to build the ultimate uh, human brain atlas. Another strong and uh, um, well-established network is the lung. Oh, sorry. Hopefully this has not... Something popped on my screen, hopefully not on yours. Um, another um, very large and substantial network is the lung atlas. Um, our first released integrated, uh, um, it, it includes the first released integrated atlas that I'm going to talk about in a moment. And then the immune atlas is also large and growing, both because of the high accessibility of samples like peripheral blood, mononuclear cells, and because immune cells are part of every tissue. Then the effort to collect a genetically and ancestrally diverse atlas is rapidly growing as well, with a lot of leadership coming actually from the Asia community. And many of the efforts of the Genetic Diversity Network are focused on the immune system, with, um, are focused on the immune system. Now, it's also really exciting to see how rapidly other efforts have been progressing. So for example, the oral and craniofacial network and the adipose network are both quite recent but they've made enormous progress in terms of data collection, really catching up to some of the networks that have started earlier. And the reproduction network is tackling organs and diseases that have often been far less studied by academic science. So the networks are also very hard at work in um, writing up specific roadmaps to guide the work ahead. Four of them have been completed for lung, gut, oral and craniofacial and development and more of them are forthcoming, as well as an update of our overall white paper. 
This is also really a great opportunity for me to thank the coordinators of each of the networks. This is really tireless work that they do very enthusiastically and to encourage all of you to join, um, to join the biological networks based on your area of interest. Okay. So now, we all, with all of these data uh, growing, um, growing rapidly, HCA is uh, focused in four major areas. Um, in four major areas. So the first one, and, and I'm going to go through all four. So the first one is Atlas integration, which is also the first, um, uh, which is also one of the major themes of our work right now. So let me say a few words on what integration looks like, what its current status is, and what the challenges ahead are. So as you may know, just over a year ago, we kicked off a multi-group team to start on this effort. The first step was to pilot a minimal viable product or an MVP of integration across six systems in what we called wave one. The immune system focused on PMDCs, the kidney, retina, gut, lung, and nervous system. We chose these six based on availability and maturity of data. The commitment, excuse me, the commitment of the bio-network coordinators to partner in this effort, and also in order to reflect different kinds of organs and so different kinds of integration challenges. Some of the integrations have a robust setup by now. Here are a couple of examples from the lung and the retina, and the others are ongoing and, and um, enhancing quickly. As I said earlier, a great first example for this came from the lung where the first integrated human lung cell atlas was published this summer. Um, this atlas has a harmonized cell annotation ontology, harmonized metadata, diverse anatomical, um, anatomical um, locations, uh, already framed into an initial common coordinate framework, or CCF, for the lung. And then a subset of these data served as the core integration and then it was extended with additional data sets using transfer learning approaches. And that led to a total of 2.4 million cell profiles from 49 data sets and almost 500 individuals. Also, the team showed how an integrated atlas like this can be queried and used. They used it for detailed cell annotation and markers to show the effects of parameters like age or BMI on cell profiles, to relate genome-wide associa association studies genes to cells, to discover new cell types or transitional states, and more. So really kudos to the team that did this, um, uh, Lisa, Malte, Fabian, Pascal, Jay, Sasha, and Martin, and all of the network coordinators in many, many contributing labs. Now, while much work remains to be done on the first wave of the MVPs, because we want to move them from minimal viable product to the next generation, um, but we're, we have also now kicked off six additional integrations, the heart, liver, skin, pancreas, and oral and craniofacial networks, but also the genetic diversity network, which poses a unique set of challenges. This integration really relies crucially on both human expertise and computational tools, like everything that we do in HCA. And that includes tools to generate references, to query them, to annotate cells, and more. And I'm highlighting some of the key tools in this area, but it's actually a pretty impressive um, toolbox beyond these tools as well. Now, as the integrated atlas are built, it is also crucial to generate in a community-minded and expert way the relevant annotation. And for this, our cell annotation platform, or CAP, helps investigators create a reference for all cell identities based on molecular signatures. CAP is a centralized platform for community-driven creation, exploration, storage, and serving of annotations at multiple levels of um, granularity. Now, while it's exciting to describe all this progress, I want you also to remember that these early integrations were truly a minimal viable product, and there's a lot of open, open questions for us to tackle as we build this first um, Atlas version, and there is actually a team that's focused now on more innovative tools to take on some of these challenges. One of the things that is top of mind right now is defining integration beyond strict cell types and their molecular signatures, for example, through the lens of gene programs. A second major challenge is balancing between the desire to harmonize and make everything the same and the inherent variation, including between conditions, locations, and individuals. There is no single correct answer because this depends on the question that we ask. If somebody wants to build a simple reference, 
say, define all the T cells across individuals in the body, you may want to remove some of the biological variation. But if you want to study inter-individual variation or inter-organ variation or variation as associated with conditions in those T cells, we want to parse out the common features that let us relate them all as T cells, but preserve some of the variation that exists between individuals or conditions. This question becomes even more prominent when we consider cross-tissue whole body integration. Here we know that the cells are the same and different at the same time. Immune, stroma, even parenchymal cells like epithelial cells, they have common features across tissues, um, but they also have tissue-specific features. The simple one-to-one -one matching will no longer work and we need a more flexible framework. Across all of these topics looms this concept of annotation and how we do it, how to balance specific expertise, the community, and what increasingly algorithms can do for us rather than just manually done by humans. Um, how do we bring all of those together? And what do we annotate besides discrete cell types? And then finally, there's many things our current integration efforts didn't yet take on or deep, uh, didn't take on deeply or at all. The challenge of integrating data that represent dynamic and developmental processes is one of them. And moving from molecular cell profiles to other levels, especially spatial ones, is the other one. And that brings me to the second major theme for HCA these days, which is Atlas expansion. HCA was never solely about RNA profiles of cells, but of course, those techniques matured and scaled the fastest. So for a long time, they were the main driver of data collection. But we are interested in all the features and properties of human cells, and those additional features are now taking center stage. So yes, single cell RNA-C gave us a fantastic first start, but as we noted in the white paper in 2017, the cellular branch of the ATLAS also include many other features that are measured at single cell resolution, including chromatin organization, protein levels and modifications, metabolic profiles, microscopic images, dynamic events like transcription and translation, and now also all of their combinations in multiomics. Then, to understand cells truly, we need to know where they are located, both with respect to a common coordinate system and relative to other cells. And this is what the spatial branch of the ATLAS um, allows us to do. And with many, many technical and algorithmic advances in the last few years, it's now progressing much more rapidly. And finally, to be a human cell ATLAS means that the ATLAS must reflect human diversity in terms of ancestry, gender, age, and geography. Um, and so all of these features also need to come into play. The first integration effort looks at just one view of cells based on RNA profiles. Now that we have these additional views and they're growing, we have the opportunity not just to integrate, but to unify, to build a unified understanding of one biological entity, the cell, that's connecting these different views. Um, and we can use the great power of computation, in particular machine learning, in order to learn how to predict one view from others and to understand how one level of organization might give rise to another. Okay. Now, as the Atlas grows, we should care not just about how we assemble it and how we release it, but also how people use it. And a core question is how we... Uh, Weary the Atlas to help us answer questions. And that's the third major um, theme for the HCA efforts. And so first, we've recently released our revamped data portal just a couple of weeks ago that's spanning right now about 50 million of the cells that have already been profiled by HCA labs, and these numbers will only grow. And in fact, that's a lot. But it's only about a quarter, maybe, of the single cell profiles out there across organisms and systems that are already published. Of course, many of them are not necessarily from human. Many of them are not necessarily from the healthy atlas. But if you just look at single cell uh, droplet-based um, data sets, they've been doubling every six months or so. So that's still very rapid growth of data. And as in many other data-rich fields, the scale of the HCA data opened the door to learn and then query a foundational model of cells 
across the human body. And in this, our community has been very prescient in realizing that once we have an atlas, machine learning algorithm would be able to do wonderful things with it. And the advances in both of these fields have progressed so nicely in a synchronized way that now that our atlas is big enough, there's also models that are fantastic at tackling and using and leveraging data of these scales. And so these models are now emerging rapidly and they're relying on different machine learning paradigms from transformer-based large language model-like models to metric learning. And I'm gonna highlight just one because it comes from my own research, um, but mostly because it is focused specifically on the question of querying. So in this effort that I'm describing here, we aim to build models um, from um, well over 100 million human cell profiles from thousands of studies potentially, and spanning not just the healthy atlas, but also disease studies so that we can look at disease relative to health and, and, and vice versa. And so now we don't just want to collect a lot of data, but we actually want to search for cells of interest in our atlas. Now, unlike in regular search, our data might not be annotated. Our cells that might interest us, maybe no one yet has given them even a name. So we can't just you know, query by the annotation of the cell. So what we decided that we want to do is mimic something called reverse image search, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but humor me, I'm actually gonna describe it. So imagine you wanted to find a leading female computational biologist from the Sanger Institute. You don't actually know their name or where they work, but they do know you do know what they look like. So all you have to do is upload their photo into reverse image search, and it will find to you their name and plenty of other photos of them and all sorts of websites and so on. And so we basically want to use the same kind of algorithm now, except that we're gonna do a reverse cell search. We put in the profile of the cell that we like, maybe ju just the full profile, no marker genes, no annotation needed, and we get back their name, if it has a name, and wherever it is in the body across all, say, 100 million cells in our index. So just like in reverse image search, we rely on something called deep metric learning to learn a metric from multiple triplets of cells, two cells that are the same by a cell annotation and one that is not. And then we train this on a subset of data that spans nearly 90 million cells and we can use it in order to take a query cell and search for similar ones and figure out uh, what it is and where the other cells are like it. And so um, in order, when, when we, applied this, um, we applied this approach to um, a data set of, uh, to, uh, to a smaller trained model of 13 million cells across 340 studies, we searched it with cells that were interesting to us because there were macrophage-like cells that were seen in fibrotic tissue in the lung, in one lung fibrosis condition. We found other cells with a state like this. And when we looked across the entire, um, when we looked across the entire, um, the entire search, we found similar cells, not only in other fibrotic conditions in the lung, but we also found them, for example, in pancreatic cancer, a very different kind of disease, but not one that is also known to be related um, to fibrosis. So we could expand the disease scope of this initial uh, fibro uh, fibrotic macrophage-like um, cell. What was also cool is that this search also yielded cells in a study where peripheral blood mononuclear cells were grown in different culture conditions, actually to study something completely different related to hematopoietic stem cells and entirely unrelated to macrophage biology. In fact, macrophages were never even mentioned in these studies. However, this algorithm found some such cells after five days in one of the conditions, uh, in one of the conditions, and this gave us conditions that we could put uh, use in the lab in order to actually enrich for these cells in a dish that we can now manipulate and screen and use for functional characterization. Okay, and that brings me to the last and final bit that our community is now pushing beyond the scope of the atlas itself in the strict sense in thinking on how the ATLAS, as well as the techniques that our community developed experimentally and computationally, can help us move from descriptive cell annotations to a causal understanding of cell function. And think about it like this. Right now, from our data and tools, we can readily identify cells and categorize them. We can label them with existing names or new ones, say where they are, describing which conditions they are found, all of these are enormously useful. 
But unless we already happen to know what the CD8 T cell does, our data do not directly tell us about new cell function. And so we are seeing people starting to take the cell function question on using the tools that we have originally perfected for the ATLAS. This is not strictly what the ATLAS is expected to deliver, but it's something that both the ATLAS, the method, and the scientists in our community um, really uh, allow us to do. And I'd venture to say that uh, it probably is what got many of us uh, started on this effort in the first place. I'll skip this. Now, before I close, I want to spend a couple of minutes on the substantial efforts of all of our working groups and committees that keep Human Cell Atlas going. We have four uh, working groups for analysis, for technology, for ethics, and for equity. And we also have one that focuses on the data ecosystem, which is brand new. In particular, I want to highlight the work of our equity working group. Partha also highlighted it as well. Partha is actually one of its leading uh, leaders and co-founders. As I showed you in the beginning, HCA has come a long way in making sure that we're a true global initiative, which is diverse, not just in our data, but also in the scientists. So that scientists can do this important work within the communities that they serve. And this involves a lot of dedicated groundwork, including workshops, which we've had this year in Latin America, Asia and Africa, and just um, this month in the Middle East. Um, and a great example of those is the recent HCA Africa workshop that was um, that happened um, earlier in the year um, in March by the Equity Working Group. And in fact, um, we have a, a little um, a little movie that is for some reason not yet running. And so this um, this uh, working group. Uh, uh, sorry, this uh, workshop, we can see the movie is now running. This workshop uh, involves scientists um, from across the HCA, uh, from multiple countries in Africa. It had both a computational and an experimental uh, component. And um, um, scientists got to learn hands on how to analyze data, how to work on it, and, and we received really uh, strong reviews. Now, um, all of this work has generated a lot of papers, a lot of papers and a lot of preprints, um, 182 papers and printed to date. And this number keeps growing again, about 60 more than last time I made this slide in the summer. Um, those, um, for the first time, we actually had a publication bundle for HCA. It has just closed with final submission, 61 submissions all through journals in nature publishing groups and these papers are now making their way and they come in three topical areas analytical methods developmental biology an organ or system specific atlas integration um there will be future bundles as well so please stay tuned and if you ever have any questions on the bundles please reach out ellen todres or email is showing on the slide and then finally hca has always been a partnership uh between uh many funders and many, and many practicing scientists across, uh, across the world, as well as a great collaboration between labs that focus both on um, the healthy atlas as well as on human disease atlases. And this collaboration ensures that the atlas really serves its ultimate mission. And so with this, I will close, wishing everyone a great meeting. I probably will not stay for the duration of tonight because here it's late in the evening. Um, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to open the meeting. Thank you very much. Aviv, thank you very much. Uh, would you be able to keep awake for a couple of questions if there are? Um, of course. If you have any questions. Let me just uh, stop sharing my screen. Yeah, there please feel free to come forward and use these standing microphones, please, the ones in the front. Uh, hi, Aviv. Um, so I have a question. Uh, as somebody who's starting out in the single cell, field, let's say, from India, how would one contribute to these regional atlases, such as HCA Asia? What is the protocol? And um, is there space to read, uh, to have some, to lead region-specific questions? For example, you must have followed work from Charlie Stanton uh, on lung cancer, P P PM 2.5 exposure. That doesn't actually bother us that much in India because we are more exposed and driving, driving lung cancer through things like open uh, fume cooking. 
So how does one uh, approach to be a part of HCA, Asia, like initiatives, and actually lead? Uh, I mean, it would be great to have some of uh, papers from India as uh, first and last authors there on your slides. Yes. So, so let me start by saying that HCA is an initiative that is open to any and all. There is no, I'm hearing some echo, but I hope you don't hear an echo. Um, there is no um, limitation on participation. All you have to do is really show up and engage in the work. So for Asia, we have a regional, we have an office. One of the executive offices is actually in Asia. I believe many people from the office, I know for sure Yoshi, because I can see him on the Zoom, are actually, and Piero and Jay, I hope, as well as Partha himself, who's the host, are all, I see Piero waving. Hi, Piero. Um, are all in the meeting, and those, uh, the protocol is as simple as send an email, either to the Asia team, or when in doubt, you can always write to HCA at humancellatlas.org, and they will always direct you to the right, uh, to the right people. And I see John Randall now as well. So it's getting better and better. And so there's plenty of people there who will help you um, orient and arrange. Leadership is the same. If you find a problem that is important to tackle, that has a unique uh, regional, I will call it flavor or aspect, because diseases, as you have just highlighted, there is different environmental causes for diseases, different um, um, risk factors that are associated with our ancestry, with our living conditions. All of those things contribute and all of those things impact ourselves. And this is why diversity in the Atlas is so important for us. And so, yes, there is great opportunity to lead in this way. I will also point you to um, Shayam, whom I don't know if he's in the meeting or not. I couldn't see him in the audience, but um, He's one of the leads in the genetic diversity side and would be, I think, a great, um, a great person to engage with as well for the Asia component. Thank you, Aviv. I don't see anyone uh, standing in front of the microphone. So thank you again, Aviv. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. So after the first keynote address, we will move into um, <laughs> talking about uh, Human Cell Atlas uh, Asia, uh, what progresses the Asia Regional Network has made. And I would like to invite uh, the leader of HCA Asia, uh, Dr. Sham Prabhakar. Uh, let me just say a couple of words about Sham. Sham actually um, is an applied physicist. That's what he did. and. Uh, he graduated from the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. Um, he then uh, did a postdoc um, in mathematics at Stanford and uh, then went on to Lawrence um, uh, Berkeley Lib uh, National Labs and did uh, a postdoc in genomics. Uh, so right now he's leading the HCA Asia and he is the principal investigator of the Asian Immune Diversity Atlas. So Sham will present to us the progresses that we have made in HCA Asia. Sham. All right, we'll go with this. Thanks very much for the introduction, Partha. Um, pleasure to be here at, I think, what is the seventh Human Cell Atlas Asia annual meeting. And uh, continuing what I hope you'll see is a long run of uh, exciting science that started uh, six years ago when Piero and Jay Shin organized the first HCA meeting in uh, Okinawa. So, um, I, as Aviv mentioned, the mission of the Human Cell Atlas is to create a comprehensive reference atlas of all the cell types and uh, in, in the human body and their properties. And then she talked about exciting new directions in multimodal analysis and uh, you know, bringing in spatial omics, multi-layered analysis and ultimately functional intersection of all these cell types, okay? I'm going to focus in my talk about the word comprehensive. What does that mean here, right? So at the, about a year ago, we did an inventory of what data sets are there in the human cell atlas um, by ancestry 
And we focused on PBMCs because there's lots of PBMC data sets in the HCA, so it's a good test case. As you can see that, you know, there were diverse data sets in Human Cell Atlas, but they were really en highly enriched for data sets of European ancestry, okay? And this is not to criticize the HCA, the, as, as everyone has mentioned before. The HCA is really in the vanguard of international omics consortia that prioritize diversity, okay? And uh, although this is, you know, you can see the data set is biased, it's not as biased as some of the other omics data sets either, uh, in the world, right? So not to criticize the HCA, but not to make excuses either. We need focused efforts to get to a comprehensive reference map. So uh, w one question that comes up, right? You know, sure, theoretically you can say, yeah, a diverse atlas is good for ethics reasons, equity reasons, and so on. But what's, what's wrong with a non-diverse atlas? You know, if you talk to people privately, they will challenge you. They'll say, okay, if we just profile Europeans, and we learn a lot about human biology, so what's wrong with that, right? So maybe I can convince you that even scientifically there's something wrong, something missing there, okay? Which the human genetics community has recognized for a long time, and I think the HCA community recognized early on. So here's some evidence from the human genetics community. So you have population-specific anecdotes, okay? But they illustrate some points. You have uh, population-specific variants, genetic variants, that influence risk of specific diseases and specific populations. And then uh, if you don't know about that, then those diseases will be underdiagnosed in those populations and not treated uh, the right way, right? Uh, you have ancestry specific and sex specific drug metabolism, drug response. And so you really need to, for precision medicine, you need to tailor your drug regimens based on specific aspects of human diversity. So surely then the science that we do has to dig up the molecular bases of all of these human differences, right? If we want medicine for everyone. And then of course, as you know, disease incidence varies across the world and some of that disease incidence variation across the world has actually driven human evolution uh, and human adaptation. As you know, we evolved genetically and also we evolved epigenetically so now we probably, most of us are uh, somewhat resistant to COVID. Four years ago, that was not the case, right? So we evolved epigenetically as well as genetically. So um, I hope these anecdotes will have convinced you, and there's a lot more anecdotes where these came from, that lack of attention to diversity is not merely an ethical problem in itself. It's also a scientific problem. It gives us an inc incomplete understanding of human biology, right? If we understand human biology better, everybody benefits and we have better treatment for diseases. And uh, definitely uh, uh, we have fewer healthcare disparities, right? So that's the equity goal uh, that we're going for. So uh, Human Cell Atlas Asia is broadly situated within the overall HCA genetic diversity network, which again uh, we've touched upon. Uh, diversity is a scientific frontier. Human geneticists have been studying diversity for a long time. The single cell community will benefit a lot by going along with them and adding, say, the transcriptomic or proteomic or spatial complements to the genetic diversity that they have been studying, right? And that's why we formed um, uh, the Human Atlas HCA Genetic Diversity Network. We've had long discussions within the network. Some of you have been part of that. Uh, and we've come up with a white paper. I encourage you to look at it, and uh, hopefully you will all help to contribute to it, right? So the HCA Diversity Network is uh, working, is about to launch version one of the HCA Diversity Atlas. It'll focus on PBMCs because that's where we have the most diverse data sets, and we'll target at least 15 genetic ancestries in V1 of the atlas. Uh, V2 will move to uh, broader cell types, reproductive, breast, eye, and many other consortia that are profiling diverse, uh, diverse cohorts, right? And the question we'll ask is, how does cells, cell type change from, or so cell type abundance, say, or cell state abundance change across ancestries, across sex, across geography, across age? How do immune phenotypes change? And um, 
uh, how do all of these uh, aspects of human diversity modulate the effects of genetic variance, for example. And Human Cell Atlas Asia is a major contributor to the GDN for the obvious reason that 60% of the world's population lives in Asia and the two of the world's most populous nations uh, are in Asia and there's tremendous diversity of all forms right, within Asia. So I would say HCA Asia has the greatest responsibility to contribute to the diversity of the HCA. Now, so I'll come back to this slightly depressing plot I showed earlier of the diversity of PBMC data sets in HCA uh, and then highlight some of the, the optimistic parts of it, which is you see the red stars, these are all data sets contributed by HCA Asia. Okay? And then over the past 12 months, there's many other efforts all over the world. It's HCA LATAM, uh, it's uh, HCA Africa. Uh, there's many more PBMC data sets coming online and so you'll see that you know, this, this, this figure is going to look a lot better uh, thanks to the efforts of all the teams in the HCA. Now, uh, I remember when I was new to the HCA, I, I was excited about the consortium and I wanted to be a part of it, but I really didn't know what it did way in the beginning. So hopefully if people have the similar thoughts right now, they can look at this and say, okay, what is HCA Asia? That's the organization you have access to right here. What, what do we do? Uh, we liaise with the global HCA for sure because our goal is to further the aims of the global HCA. Uh, in practice, we hold annual meetings like this one. We hold workshops. Supata so held a workshop yesterday. We'll be holding an AIDA workshop tomorrow. We collaborate with the HCA Equity Working Group. Uh, we help in uh, education, communications, and uh, we adopt and uh, adapt ethics toolkits for single cell research. And then perhaps where the rubber meets the road the most is the flagship projects. I'll talk soon about the first flagship project of HCA Asia, and then we have a flagship projects session later in this meeting where we'll talk about some of the other efforts, right? And uh, so I'd say uh, this is where we put into practice all of these principles by coming together as a group and uh, working within consortia within Asia. So I hope that each HCA me meeting, where HCA Asia meeting, will seed a flagship project from now on. And I'll give you examples of some of the seeds that have already begun sprouting. And of course, none of this is possible without funders. So the CZI, uh, I should mention, have been a great source of funding for HCA's uh, Asia projects. Uh, but uh, also a lot of HCA research, Asia researchers have leveraged that to get local funding, to leverage their international CZI funding to get local funding to get uh, even bigger data sets. And there are other uh, funders potentially we can access, some of whom are in this meeting. Uh, and philanthropic foundations as well. Right? And uh, based on all this, we hope to achieve the goals that I laid out uh, and advance you know, diversity in HCA clinical benefit and also the benefit to the local communities that you're working with for the research. So here's the first flagship project of Human Cell Atlas Asia, SAIDA, the Asian Immune Diversity Atlas. It's been around for a few years now and uh, we contributed to the publication package that uh, Aviv just mentioned. Uh, AIDA has uh, eight or nine countries uh, and some of the leaders of AIDA are over here. Uh, uh, we're profiling PBMCs using five prime single cell RNA seq to look at the effects of genetics, ancestries, age, sex, geography, lifestyle, environment on our blood. And uh, there's a major scientific goal here. Right? We understand in the abstract that all of these factors matter, right? In reality, we don't know how much they matter. It's one thing to say these are important, but then do they affect 0.1% of the variation in your blood cell traits? Do they affect 10% of the variation in human blood cell traits? How important are they quantitatively, right? We don't really know, or I think we're starting to learn from this kind of study. Before that, there were really scattered bulk omics-based studies. There's very little knowledge in the world about this. 
And on a more practical note, we want to create a healthy baseline for precision medicine in Asia to take these healthy data sets, use them as comparators for disease cohorts. Uh, initially f focusing on diabetes and cancer, but diversifying infectious disease also. So a key aspect of IDA, which I believe has contributed to whatever the successes we've had so far, uh, is that we've harmonized the workflow, harmonized the protocol across all the teams. You'll see lots of single cell studies in the world. Uh, for example, some COVID studies which got off the ground really fast by necessity and each team was doing its own thing because there's no time to coordinate, right? But then the quality of the data sometimes suffers. It's hard to integrate data from the many teams in your consortium. If they're all using different reagents, different sample collection uh, um, protocols, and even different you know, read mapping and bioinformatics downstream. So I try to avoid that by harmonizing everything end to end. Uh, we didn't fully succeed. There are still batch effects across study sites, but much, much smaller batch effects, I would say, than uh, you know, some of the studies in the literature. So phase one uh, of IDA profiles um, you know, individuals from five countries. It's about 600 individuals in total now. And you can see that they cover genetically, they cover much of the diversity of the genetic diversity in Asia. Uh, reasonably evenly balanced between males and females. It's a nice distribution of adult ages. So we're covering the so we're covering the genetic diversity, sex diversity, age diversity to a decent extent in Asia. And those are the three axes of human variation we're in. We're addressing right now with phase one. So the, uh, then some surprises, right? Because no one has done this kind of study on a large scale before. Of of any population in the world, really, not just Asians, right? So um, it's common in some epidemiology studies to say, you know, we'll stratify by Europeans, Asians, Africans, and so on, right? But these groups are obviously not monoliths. And here you can see here, for example, the propor proportion of regulatory T cells across these Asian population groups is more or less uniform, but then in the Korean cohort, you have about half the regulatory T cells you have in the other populations. So, so clearly, right, there's can be profound differences within, within Asia and within, you know, genetically similar groups in Asia. Right? So it's genes and environment, the combined effect of that, that we're looking at over here. And that's why the single cell field really needs to address this issue. And then uh, we talked about um, ancestry or country. Now we'll look at male-female differences. Here's, you know, you're looking at the proportion of nine B cells. Red is female, blue is male. You can see here that you know, males generally have more naive B cells, but not so much in Japan. Okay? In Japan, naive B cell proportions are very similar uh, between males and females. In India, dramatic difference in uh, proportion between males and females. And so this, again, tells you that ancestry is important. Where you do your science is important. If you do, you know, look at differences between males and females in your country, you are not studying necessarily human biology. You're studying biology of your country or your population. And the differences between males and females may be different in different parts of the world, right? And I think that's a very, very important message. Even very fundamental aspects of human biology, biology change when you go to a different part of the world, not necessarily because of genetic differences, also lifestyle and environment. And then uh, age is, effect of age is also modulated by ancestry. Here you can see on the left hand side, naive CD4 T cells, they slowly deplete over uh, with time as you go from 20 years to 70 years old. But you can see these colored lines here, the, you know, they don't deplete uniformly in all uh, ancestries. In fact, in some ancestries, they're flat or even arguably slightly increasing, right? So uh, none, none of these aspects of human biology, you can, you can confidently say you've studied and understood if you look at only one population. Uh, and so now the single cell aspect of it, if you go look at it, really fine grained. okay? So this is a UMAP plot. Each dot is a cell. There's about a million cells here from IDA. Um, and we're highlighting differences between populations in Singapore, 
studied side by side, batch randomized, same protocol, collected in the same batch and stuff like that. Chinese, Malay and Indian ancestry, people living in Singapore, okay. Orange means that this part of gene expression space has, for example here, Indians versus Chinese. Orange means Indians have way more cells in this part of expression space than Chinese uh, uh, Singaporeans. Uh, way more meaning four times more or eight times more, okay, jaw dropping. So this is one subset of naive B cells. And then when you look at say these uh, gamma, delta and mate cells among the T cells, uh, Chinese Singaporeans have fourfold more than Indian Singaporeans. These are really, really dramatic differences and these are subsets of naive CD4 T cells that either either more abundant in Indian Singaporeans or more abundant in Chinese Singaporeans, again fourfold differences. Right? And you really need single cell resolution to characterize these. And uh, again, these could be some combination of genetics and lifestyle, they're highly confounded. Right? But I, I hope you'll get the picture that there's massive diversity and here we're trying to quantify the percentages, right? So uh, one E minus one means, uh, you know, R squared of 0.1, right? So uh, how much of the variability in our blood cell proportions is explained by age, ancestry, body mass index, and sex? So if you compare them, body mass, uh, age does explain some amount, body mass index does explain some amount, but far more variation in our blood cell pr proportions is explained by ancestry and sex. And ancestry and ex sex are about comparable, which to us was a big surprise, right? In any epidemiological study, you will believe that, okay, my cohort needs to be balanced between males and females, right? That's like bread and butter ABCs of epidemiology. But what this is saying is that it's just as important to balance your cohort across ancestries. Because ancestry also affects human biology, your blood, blood cell proportions for sure, just as much. Right? Of course, this is just the first step. We have to study all aspects of our cellular and molecular variation to say how much does ancestry contribute sex, age and everything, lifestyle and so on. Uh, but I hope you can see that you get some very surprising results uh, when you look at this systematically. So to summarize, uh, cell proportions are variable in blood, Asians are not all the same, male-female differences depend on ancestry, effect of age depends on ancestry, ancestry inflex influences cell states as strongly as sex. Uh, and for precision medicine, we need studies of ancestry effects in uh, normal human biology, right? which is what I've shown here. And then you can understand how it affects disease biology. But if you take your normal healthy baseline from one population, it may not be applicable to a different population. So, uh, and then on the technical side, uh, all of this was possible because we did a lot of work and pilot studies on harmonizing the protocol and we centralized the uh, data processing within IDA. Uh, also, we implemented cost-aware single cell uh, workflows so that you, you can get, you know, per data set, your cost is much less because we are pooling PBMCs across individuals and then processing in one single pool. Please talk to us about it if you're interested. A lot of people come to us and say, hey, single cell is too expensive. What you're saying is great, but you know, it costs too much money. We're just not gonna do it. It's far cheaper than you think once you start pooling cells. Okay? And DNA sequencing has gotten cheaper as well. And of course, there's a lot of work we did on data storage and ethics and data release policies and uh, um, working with informed consent, working with the cohorts and so on, working with uh, actually epidemiologists who have a lot of experience in this. Uh, we can perhaps discuss this in the breaks. Right? So um, I hope uh, you know, at this meeting we can identify strengths, challenges, opportunities in HCA Asia and uh, build more such projects like AIDA. I'll quickly mention in the acknowledgements, Kian Hong, who's driven, who's led the Singapore side of the AIDA work. Also my collaborator, John Chambers, who leads Singapore's, the Helios cohort in the Singapore National Precision Medicine Program. Jay Shin, who's leading the uh, Japanese arm of AIDA and is now in GIS. Bo Siang Liu, who's also in the meeting doing splicing QTLs. Uh, and the broader AIDA team. Uh, we, we had a workshop last year in Bangkok organized by Varadam and Ponpan 
and we'll have an IDA workshop this year as well uh, in two days. So uh, um, some of the other exciting work happening in uh, HCA Asia, uh, this is driven by Bo Xiang. He's looking, he's using the IDA data to look at splicing QTLs. The big advantage of 5' prime single cell RNA-seq is that the RNA-seq reads cover the whole transcript. They're not just stuck at the 3' prime end. Because they cover the whole transcript, you can call splice junctions to some extent. And if you can call splice junctions, you can do splicing QTL analysis, and splicing QTLs are comparably important to expression QTLs in terms of how much disease associations they have. And then um, uh, Jay and Chung and Piero and others uh, are driving TCRE, transcribed cis regulatory element analysis, uh, and the initial uh, manuscript that they've submitted with the HCA paper package is not based on either data, but now they're analyzing either data as well. Again, this is an advantage of five prime single cell RNA seq analysis. The five prime reads start at the transcription start site. So the, it tells you immediately what the, where the promoter is, which promoter is being transcribed. The 5' reads also give you enhancer RNAs. So give you simultaneously, they give you epigenomic or gene regulatory information in addition to the transcriptomic information. And then you have uh, 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 Irene, uh, Herwati, Safarina, Nick Banovich, Marikov, uh, Cox uh, leading the uh, uh, Indonesian Immune Atlas of Genetic and uh, Environmental Diversity. Indonesia is a huge country in Asia, tremendously genetically diverse, and they're collecting samples in the field, which is an impressive feat, okay, and took a lot of hard work to keep those samples healthy and processable, and they're uh, just starting the data generation over there. Again, funded by CZI. Uh, and part of the CZ Ancestry Networks. And then a massive effort in South Korea, uh, SCADE, a uh, single cell atlas of uh, uh, immune diseases. And uh, this is a large consortium. And I, I keep coming back to this point. Uh, there's a lot of exciting single cell science in Asia, but I hope that those various arrows will all align and point in the same direction and work in, in, in as consortia towards a common aim, right? And there's a lot of power in that. So SCADE is looking at, uh, I think, 16 autoimmune diseases, including some very rare autoimmune diseases, and profiling uh, millions of cells. I think this 3.2 million figure that they have in their estimates, is uh, uh, projections, is an underestimate. They have probably way overshoot this. Uh, uh, and it'll be an incredible resource for autoimmune disease in Asia. As you know, the immune system evolves very fast. If you look in any species, the immune system diverges rapidly, right? Because it's part of the evolutionary arms race that we have with pathogens. And so it's very, very important to characterize immune-related diseases in distinct populations. And then uh, Parka, who just opened this meeting, uh, and uh, Shinjuti uh, working on uh, uh, another CZF-funded project, the Pediatric Cell Atlas of Nasal and uh, Oral Mucosa, led by Hozo, uh, Jose Ordovas Montanas uh, from Boston. And here they're looking, you can see globally all over the world, at uh, diverse, so this is part of the HCA philosophy, right? Building an atlas of any particular tissue or organ right from the scratch by uh, profiling samples all over the world. And uh, in the, at the Kolkata site, uh, led by Partha, uh, they're looking at seven geographically diverse sites. So I want to highlight this point that uh, diversity is not merely country A, country B, country C. Within individual countries, you have tremendous diversity, especially some of the larger countries like India, China, um, Thailand, Indonesia, and so on, you have a lot of ancestral diversity within the country, you have a lot of geographical terrain diversity, and so on. So it's important to do your epidemiology even within the country in multiple sites, because the default simplest thing to do is to do it in the biggest city in your country, but that is not such a representative population. Uh, and then, uh, so these are the HCA Asia projects that I've shown so far, but um, HCA Asia is also supporting 
a lot of projects that are not officially HCA Asia, but working very closely. Uh, for example, uh, the project uh, led by uh, Shenjuti and Yogesh, uh, CHRF in Bangladesh, they're looking at variation res vaccine response in preterm infants using single cell sequencing. And this is one of those obvious synergies with IDA, for example, where the healthy cohorts and healthy atlases, we're single cell atlases, we're building a PBMCs in IDA, can help to guide the data analysis of their preterm infant cohort. And th this is funded by the Gates Foundation. Uh, another uh, effort in HCA Asia, but building out from uh, an earlier healthy liver atlas uh, that uh, Ram uh, and others from Singapore were working on, uh, led by Gary Bader. So there's the healthy liver atlas, and then within the HCA now, Ram and colleagues uh, work using that healthy atlas to build to how does the healthy at at liver behave during disease progression. So going towards, say, you know, fatty liver, uh, steatohepatitis, and then eventually to cancer. Uh, and of course, the next phase of all this is functional studies to look at the mechanisms that you identified here. So um, I hope this has given you an idea that there's a lot of seeds sprouting in Human Cell Atlas Asia, a lot of work going on. In yesterday's meeting, uh, there was even more science uh, of single cell research in India, not necessarily part of Human Cell Atlas Asia, uh, but the goal of this meeting is to see how we can seed new projects like AIDA that, uh, or like the liver atlas that Ram is working on, that, that can bring people together and be greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, three flagship project sessions in this meeting, I hope you'll attend, uh, Asian Cancer Atlas, Infectious Disease, and Human Microbiome Diversity Atlas. All of these initiatives are the fruit of may, a few years of discussion such as these in HA Asia meetings. Uh, but they're not the only ones. We're also working together on diabetes, aging, single cell genetics, and anything else that a reasonable, reasonable number of people from multiple countries can work together on. Um, and yeah, this is really what we're hoping for. Thank you. Uh, you take some questions into that? Um, yes, I mean, if there are some questions, please come forward to the standing microphones and uh, Sham will be happy to answer some of those questions. Thanks, Shyam. Um, hi, everyone. Um, we have a number of virtual attendees um, who are joining online, and they've asked a number of questions in the chat, so I might kick us off today. Um, uh, Mojtaba Panjapur has asked a general question, Shyam. Um, they've asked, how many cells do we have? How many cells do we have in each organ and tissue, and is this an important matter for HCA? How many cells in each organ? That's a good Big question. question. So, so blood is about one million uh, uh, mononuclear cells per milliliter, and um, mononuclear cells are only about, I mean, ignoring the red blood cells, uh, mononuclear cells are only about 20%, 30% say, of your blood. So let's say five million cells per milliliter of blood, and you have a few liters of blood in your body. So you have billions of blood cells, and overall you have more than a trillion cells in the body. Uh, we want to representatively sample some, some subset of those. Hi, I'm Juveria. I'm a PhD student at IIT Delhi. I work on genetic diversity in northern India. I am fascinated by this work. This is great work. I learned that IDA is up for review for the second wave. Uh, it would be great to learn how to contribute to this initiative beyond uh, submitting samples. Beyond submitting? Uh, samples. Ah, OK. Uh, Let's, let's, let's talk after this. So how can people contribute to IDA and some of the other initiatives?
please join the flagship project session. And these are, AIDA is an open consortium. AIDA started with only three countries. And now it's eight or nine countries. So it's just whoever raises their hand and wants to join, and then we try to get funding for them. So there are some countries who would like to join AIDA, would be, and we would welcome them. We still don't have funding for them. So that is the last shoe to drop, right? But all of these consortia are completely open. And once, once you join the consortium, then we have regular monthly meetings or bi-monthly meetings um, uh, where we share methodology and our, our protocols are all on protocols.io. Uh, and we, we do, uh, you know, we share all our data analysis and data generation methodology. Uh, so, so I guess in principle, what, what are the ingredients, right, if you want to join this consortium? You need to have the ethics in place, you need to have access to samples. Ideally, you need to have ability to generate the data yourself, because you mentioned that you, know, you don't want to be just a sample provider. And definitely in AIDA, uh, we try to ensure that every team that can, you know, to the extent possible, generates the data themselves. Right? Uh, it's a long road to get there, but it's, it's, it's good to start. Right? Single cell data generation capability is essential. We generate actually single cell spatial nanopore data in our lab, so we have that established. So it would be great to catch after. Fantastic. Then I think, uh, and then if you have the ethics in place, yeah. and if you have a cohort already, the only thing left is money. And so let's talk about that. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I, Sean, yeah, Jim Yao here. Yeah, so uh, it's very nice uh, IDA project and the data. So because this project create very big data and a lot of AI experts have shown strong interest in mining such data, but they were very keen to work on such data to answer specific biological questions, not just for the sake of building the algorithm. So like how we can involve those like AI experts, talents to yeah, to engage them to into like immunological questions, biological questions, and then we tap on their AI experts to the mine to mine this uh, big data mine. Yeah, to get the the, the, the the biological insights. That's a great question. So, uh, either data have already been released via cell by gene, and you can play with it. Uh, the gene cell matrices are downloadable from the HCA data portal. Uh, the raw data are not all downloadable because there are some ethics issues and HCA still will soon roll out the uh, managed data access methodology. But I think with the gene cell matrices, you can already make a lot of progress. So uh, data sometimes to, uh, some AI, to some AI scientists, maybe just like a numbers or metrics. So maybe, maybe there's a way to like engage them into a more like a uh, discussion like towards answering uh, immunological questions and bring them into this uh, society? I, I think, so um, we've also mentioned some very promising AI methods in the single cell field, so lots of buzz around that. Uh, we're, we, we actually, we're testing some of the AI data integration methods ourselves. Uh, for the immune cell atlas, for example. Um, yeah, if you have any specific ideas, we'd love to hear about it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lucia, I think, has some more questions for online. Yeah. Thank you, Shyam. Um, Amarinda Singh Tind um, wants to ask about whether um, you have any thoughts on single nuclei versus single cell approach for the human cell atlas. Thanks for that. The single nuclei will become very important for banked frozen tissues. It's kind of the only way you can ac do single cell omics on, almost the only way you can do omics on frozen uh, tissues. Uh, for blood, luckily, you don't have to do that. You can do single cell. Hi, Sean. Uh, Evan Biederstedt, Harvard Medical School. 
I don't want to be the person who publicly disagrees with you on the need for diversity in uh, cell atlases because I do agree with you, but uh, I thought I'd uh, ask you a few devil's advocates questions just to, uh, please, please. you know, uh, maybe be controversial or make sure I understand the argument. So you showed us a, 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 a UMAP with, uh, I think it was Malay versus Han Chinese versus Tamil uh, gene expression differences with uh, uh, via, via ancestry, right? And my brain immediately goes to what is sort of the, the mechanism for this. I think of functional genomics. I think lots of biologists, they'd like to think in terms of maybe it's the environment or um, you know, various other diet, et cetera. And that could be true, but I immediately think I want to see it in the data. So doesn't that mean that we really should be relying mostly on genotyping? Shouldn't this mean that we should be going back to do whole exome sequencing? We still haven't done this very well for ancestries outside of Europeans and white Americans. The references we use, the, the variant calling pipelines we use, they're still very European-centric. So that's my first question. Isn't it just sort so of... Evan, the audio is a bit muffled. If you can yeah, hold should, the microphone uh, I can further really from move your down mouth. Here. I think uh, I'm too tall, so the microphone is, is coming up and down. But I can sit down as well. So my question is, I'm not sure how much you heard that, but you showed a UMAP with uh, three different ancestries. Yeah, and I think you're saying something you need exome sequencing for... Yeah, I'm interested in functional genomics, right? I'm the naysayer who says this is just transcriptomic noise. I want to see actually like missense variants, things like this that's driving those differences. What do you say to that? And two, if you agree with that, what does this mean that we should be doing? Should we be doing matched genome sequencing for each one of our single cell patients? Should we be doing bulk RNA variant calling with our data sets? What are you really suggesting we do to address these uh, issues in genomics with diversity? So that's my, my questions. Uh, th thanks. I, I'll try to do justice for it. I wasn't able to hear all of the question, but, but my understanding is that you're asking about, you know, the gene expression is incomplete. You really need deep genetic profiling of these individuals as well. Is that a fair summary? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, great. Uh, point very well taken, actually, in either we've done whole genome sequencing of some subset of the cohort pro for precisely that reason. We have not analyzed that data alongside the gene expression data yet, simply because we do not have enough people to analyze the data fast enough. But that's exactly what we're trying to do. As you mentioned, it's some combination of genes and environment, and to disentangle that, we need to at least understand the genetics, characterize the genetics very, very explicitly at high resolution, including rare variants, missense variants, and so on. Excellent point. So, so the expression studies has to, so the human genetics community and the single cell community or the HCA community have to meet and pool their strengths and ways of looking at the data. And that's actually already happening. In fact, I think half the researchers, at least half the PIs in AIDA now are human geneticists because they, they see the value of this resource and we see the value of their expertise. Okay. Um, thank you, Sam, for uh, kind introduction about the HCA. Um, HCA meeting and uh, the kind of projects going on. I had a um, you know simple question that since we are creating um, huge data and uh, also we are creating biological networks, um, at some stages maybe these uh, networks could be of regulatory nature and you might like to develop mathematical models. So are there in this um, you know, consortium, um, their plan to actually integrate mathematical models for um, biological networks and their dynamics? Uh, so, uh, so your question is, are there efforts to develop such models? Yes, yes. Uh, generative models? Uh, kind of. Generative models of, okay, which I'm not talking about generative AI. But let's say first principles, you know, differential equation models. Exactly, mechanistic like base. Uh, for gene expression dynamics, um, to model this kind of data, I am not aware of any such models. The models would be horrendously complex and full of parameters that we don't know, you know, just a big black box with. We don't even know the architecture of the model, right? What connects to what, even before we get to what are the edge weights in that model. So um, short answer is no, and my personal belief is premature. That it's just too complex to build a differential equation model of that. 
and people build ODE models of individual signaling pathways, right? Yeah. Um, even that, there's so many missing edges and nodes in those networks and so biased by the handful of genes people have studied well. But if you go from one signaling pathway to the whole genome or the whole cell, uh, I think we are far from that. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sham. That was a wonderful exposition of what's going on in uh, HCA Asia, particularly in IDA, in the IDA project. Uh, we will take a break now, but before you move out of, the, of this hall, we would like to take a group photograph and if we could all line up in the front, uh, it will be easy for us to take that photograph. The photographer is here, right? So let's all line up in the front. It won't take more than three minutes uh, if we quickly line up. Some of us can be on the stage, some of us can be at the no, below. <laughs>